Hello, horror files. You are listening to Dissecting Horror, examining the anatomy of fear in film, television, and literature. I'm writer and performer Kelsey Zukowski. I'm filmmaker Stephen Aguilera. In this episode, we'll examine the 1999 film, The Haunting, with comparisons to the 1963 version and the Shirley Jackson novel, both covered in previous podcasts. This dissection will contain minor spoilers, though these subjects aren't especially prone to spoilage. We are the Horror Whisperers, your champions of horror and keepers of the fearscape, on this podcast of frightsome delights, if you will. I will, and we hope you will join us too, won't you? A scientist and his three test subjects are menaced by phantoms in an old mansion in this remake of the 1963 classic, according to HBO Max. It should be noted, however, that the studio DreamWorks Pictures did not actually have the rights to produce a remake of the 1963 film, so that's actually wrong. Instead, they drew upon the novel The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, which both films were based. They were going to actually call it by the book's original full name, but didn't want people to confuse it with House on Haunted Hill, which was to be released later that year in 1999. This film began as a collaboration between Steven Spielberg and Stephen King in adapting Shirley Jackson's novel. But due to creative differences, things eventually dissolved, with King converting his script into the 2002 miniseries Rose Red. So dissatisfied with the finished film, Spielberg reportedly ensured no mention of his name was made in the credits. Wes Craven was also developing a remake of the 1963 film, but opted to instead direct Scream. I've had so much I wanted to get off my chest since first seeing this film on home video back in 2002. Um, Did you actually see the Rose Red miniseries? I've never heard of it. I've heard of it. Um, If I did watch it, it was so long ago, but now I want to watch that. And I mean, I'm very glad Wes Craven did Scream, but I would have loved to see what he did with this. (laughs) Yeah, I think if I were to have been charged with rewriting that book, I would come up with something really different and, and... I could see how I would make it just my own miniseries or something later. So I'm curious what Stephen King would have done with it. I probably first watched this film maybe a few years after it came out. It was kind of like right around the time I was getting into horror, maybe like 2002, 2003-ish. Anything that was horror or caught my eye, I would just get. So I, I remember owning this one and watching it a few times. But of course, that was without the perspective of the source material, because at that time I hadn't experienced the book or the 63 film. So I, I definitely enjoyed it at the time. And this was probably my first time revisiting it. And I don't know, close to 20 years, probably, mm-hmm. <laughs> or something like that. And um Definitely the flaws show a lot more, but I actually did enjoy aspects of it as well. So I think the main thing is really it's, it's was the setting, which I can see in some ways how they made it too big and theatrical, where it is maybe more like stage play and less realistic. But I'm also very much will swoon at castles and dark macabre little settings. So in a way, I, it kind of did sweep me away. And I'm like, I get it. I get it, Eleanor. I'd be under this house's spell too. Just all the the gothic beauty and the grand details. And it was almost like a gothic castle. So I kind of uh, could connect with Eleanor and be enamored a little bit more on that aspect. Again, it's it's definitely more cheesy over the top. It loses all the subtlety and the the craftily interweaving, foreboding exploration of the supernatural and psychological. This version is really not psychological at all and doesn't tap into the human condition really at all. Um, I think one big one big issue is. Um, Eleanor as a character, it's not really the same character in many ways. Uh, Her situation, while, you know, somewhat desperate, she's just lost her her place where she lives. Uh, She's not really treated with fairness, empathy, or, or respect from her sister. But she's not really in that same demeaning, desperate situation. She's a little lost, but kind of to the point where... You know, we've all kind of been there. She'll figure it out. Like, it doesn't really go into this erratic, offbeat mindset of someone lost and and desperate. Like, you get little touches of it, but she's also a fairly inconsistent character. At sometimes, 
she's the strong her- heroine who's you know empathetic and standing up for herself and it's uh, and and at times she's uh very sheltered and withdrawn and just doesn't have many social experiences so I think a big again there there are major uh, issues with the writing it is very overt to the point where it's almost comical and over the top where you take a lot of things less seriously I think for me it really the first hour I had had me more whereas like I would say guilty pleasure except for I feel no shame like (laughs) (laughs) if something gives me enjoyment I don't care if it's not like the most uh you know eloquent thing ever um if it gives me enjoyment like I'll still say yeah I like that I enjoyed that for what it was but it's really the last half hour when it finishes Pretty much at the hour point, it's where the 63 film and the book essentially end. It just slightly tweaks that ending and just goes into a direction that is could have been good in a different scenario. Um, they kind of they give you a more concrete, this is the answer, this is the villain, this is what he did, and gives... Uh, Eleanor a chance to be the hero and feel connected to something which seems all great on paper but it just had a way of feeling very generic and run-of-the-mill ghost story and yes safe for sure it lost any character examination or this focus on loneliness and the human condition and really any poeticism to it so I think that's the biggest flaw is, yeah, it was everything was so overt and and yeah, went a very safe route where there are a lot of times where horror films will end on this twist that kind of changes everything. And there is some there there is power to ending on that stinger, but there's also been so many times where I'm like, oh, I wish you would have just had this happen a little earlier and explored this more because there's something really interesting here. And if they're if they were gonna end at that hour point and go a different direction, there's so many more interesting things that they could have done. There are uh, a handful of aspects that not only I liked, but I loved about this film. And that would include the cinematography, the cast, the set design, sound design, and the score. Now, I think the cinematography in certain points, they didn't really need to do a dramatic push in that many times during this conversation when she wasn't saying anything too profound. There's a little bit over the top, almost Michael Bayish in that regard. But Jan de Bont, the director who uh, had also directed Speed, Speed 2, Twister, and Laura Croft, Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life, that was actually his, his uh, last director credit, I believe. But he is first and foremost a cinematographer. He has, uh, I believe, 66 credits, including such films as Cujo, Die Hard, The Hunt for Red October, Flatliners, and Basic Instinct. So he's definitely a very visually oriented chap, and I really appreciated that. The, The movie just looks absolutely gorgeous. But I don't want to be offensive, but he is from Europe, and... Europeans are kind of weird sometimes, uh, especially when you get into the Netherlands where he's from. You just think like Mentos commercials, if you remember those, or Five Minute Crafts. It's like there's something a little off about this. I don't know if it's a language thing, but I felt like uh, he missed the mark a bit. And maybe he just didn't feel grounded as a director to hold his own. But there were instances where things were unnecessary, like a statue would come to life and attack them. And he says in the Blu-ray special features that points like this were done at the insistence of the studio who felt like, oh, we need more scares. So we'll just throw some random thing in there with CG. And I I respected him more after hearing that because it wasn't really his fault. But still, he could have stood his ground a little bit more and done something a bit better. I I think he's, he's gotten a lot of backlash on that. On Rotten Tomatoes, the film has a dismal 17% critic score and a 28% audience score. So it was not well received. It made $173,311,151 
worldwide against an $80 million budget. Plus you get the uh, home video and whatever merchandising soundtracks and all that kind of stuff. Right. So it did okay. It made its money back even after marketing costs. If I understand how all that stuff works and I'm still confused. This <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it was a little bit too, too epic cinematography wise, but it was still so gorgeous. The cast I felt was top notch. I really loved the cast. Lily Taylor, who was also well known for a successful horror franchise, The Conjuring. Liam Neeson, who also starred as Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn in Star Wars The Phantom Menace that same year. Catherine Zeta-Jones and Owen Wilson. Now, I don't know how you feel about Owen Wilson, but he's he's one of those love him or hate him kind of guys. I, I love Owen to death. And mm -hmm. he was my favorite character in this film. And he brought such a um, a breath of fresh air and levity to it all. I just loved every scene he was in. I had this weird glitch in my matrix ever since that movie because his character's name is Luke. But in real life, his <laughs> brother's name is Luke Wilson. He's a famous guy. So to this day, I keep wanting to call Owen Luke and I, I, I it just does something that crosses my wires. Yeah, I was writing my notes. I actually had written some about the cast too. And I meant to write Owen Wilson, but his name was Luke in the film. So I did put Luke Wilson and had to go back and correct it. <laughs> yeah, what can you do? The, the character's name in the book was even Luke. So it, it's set in stone. But yeah, from there, the, the set design, there's this um, Academy Award winning set design guy that just did this amazing job. They even rented the hangar where the Spruce Goose, what's his name? Um, the eccentric gajillionaire. His name is not Norman Rockwell. It's uh, the, the, the movie The Aviator with uh, uh, Leo DiCaprio. Yeah. That guy. Well, he had this huge space for this huge aircraft. And they had to rent that because the sets were that big. And mm -hmm. they really went out of their way to do that. And I think it was unnecessary, actually. But it was still nice to see. The lighting and all that, of course, was really great. It was it was a much different style from the 63 film in a way that part of me thinks the 63 film with its intimacy was better. I like that overall for this story. But at the same time, it was just so gorgeous. I can't help but to feel some admiration for what they put out here. Now, the sound design was also a, an award-winning guy that just did a kajillion films. And I think if you don't have a good sound designer for a horror film, then you're fucked because you know, mm -hmm. that's like half of it right there. But the score by Jerry Goldsmith, I'm a huge Jerry Goldsmith fan. And that score was, it was eerie. It was mysterious, threatening, beautiful. It was just masterful. And I've listened to the soundtrack many times over the years. So yeah, I think that's about it. It was, it was paced well, even at a, an hour and 53 minutes. I was never bored. I was questioning half of what I was watching, but it, I wasn't <laughs> bored if nothing else. Yeah, I definitely, um, yeah, the visual design was really great. And again, like, I think I was just sort of enamored with the whole atmosphere that kind of pulled me away. And there were, there were some, definitely some additions, some things you could say, oh, do, do they really need this? Or some things that were a little too over the top. And even with some of the different rooms, the flooded library and the sort of carousel thing I, they created. But I that kind of added to the whole, you know, macabre fun house sort of a thing to me your earlier note about um the director didn't really want all these jump scares and statues coming to life that that kind of checks that the studio wanted it more of a traditional jump jump scare sort of a movie which is a shame because i'm uh, suggest that they didn't really understand the source material because that's really not the point at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just make a different a different ghost movie. But uh, there were things that were initially kind of creepy and interesting, almost like the cherubs uh, coming to life, but then became like super overdone and over the top mm -hmm. where it kind of lost the appeal. So almost a little bit of that don't show too much or at least show something different, you know, to sort of switch it up. I, I really uh, overall did enjoy the cast as well. I love Lily Taylor and pretty much everything. And I love how much horror she's done. Uh, so and I think she really offered while it's a bit inconsistent and not the most um, true uh, version of this character. Again, that's more the writing and direction that they went uh, a different route with the character. But she definitely, um, she is a little, I guess, less whiny. She is um, a little bit more grounded. Uh, it does take some away from her character that she is, she doesn't seem to be um, 
is much on the edge of this mental instability and this uh, desperation. So she kind of comes across a little bit, maybe a little introverted, a little misunderstood. She hasn't lived the most exciting life, but a fairly normal person, um, which does take a little bit away from what her story and the power of Hill House as a whole that um, it, it plays just more, a little bit more like your average haunting with evil spirits preying on her and, you know, Things escalate from there, but she still plays uh, the role very well. She's likable, empathetic in moments. She knows when to slowly push herself out of her self-doubt and timidness and stand her ground. And then, of course, ends up having a, a little bit more of a, a hero churn. Uh, I really liked Catherine Zeta-Jones as well as a bold and confident, free-spirited Theo. I do think in the both of uh, 63 version and even more so the novel, she is a, definitely a more fleshed out character and has more of the chances to show that mix of compassion and pushback in equal measure. But what for, for what the material she was given, she was a fun and likable character. I typically like Owen Wilson. I'm kind of mixed on him in this film. I think it's not – it wasn't really on him. Like, he played the character and material well. He's definitely used as the comedic relief. And I don't think this film needed it. I guess that's a matter of, you know, opinion and personal taste that there is – Granted, this film goes a different direction, but the original material is loneliness and desperation and how everything is futile, essentially. So I can see why they're like, OK, let's let's throw in some, you know, fun one liners and whatnot. And again, he does well with it and he does offer a little bit of the skeptical view of kind of being the first one to feel like, OK, I feel like we're not really being told the whole truth here. But um, again, I didn't hate his character, but I it, he felt like a lesser character and offered less to the story than other versions of the character of Luke did. Liam Neeson was uh, pretty good as Dr. Merrow. Again, I think it's the writing kind of limited him. There is a mix of well-intentioned deception and ambition mixed with some compassion as things escalate and he kind of realizes that things have gotten under control and more than what he intended. Much of his screen time... It, in Hill House is a bit of an act and it's not very authentic. But again, that's that's the character and what he's trying to um, trick these people into feeling. So he is limited in what he can offer because by the time he kind of comes out of not trying to deceive them anymore, it's he's really just mostly there to try to save Nell. So I think, um, again, they just don't really focus on his intentions and depth as a character but to be fair Eleanor is the focus I think everyone did their job exceptionally well except for the screenwriter director and producers I have so much admiration for the professionalism and expertise employed by those other departments in selling to the best of their abilities something which on paper sucked pretty hard and I think it was only those departments' efforts that made this film work for me at all, despite the really bad storytelling. Still, all those terrible script choices did reflect badly on those other departments, and they did their jobs right. And it was, um, yeah, that script, it just brought the whole thing down. The yeah. two, uh, going back to a point you brought up earlier, um, about the cherubs, there's actually only maybe two or three moments in the film that were actually legitimately creepy to me. And one was her laying in bed, looking over and seeing all of these carved cherubs, which are like little little children, uh, angel kind of uh, mm -hmm. whatever characters. They're carved into the fireplace and she glances away and she glances back and now they're all facing her. And that's a thing where no... CG was used at all. They just simply swapped out those cherubs for mm -hmm. ones that were more turned in her direction. And that was just so chilling. And you kind of question, wait, was I remembering it wrong? Did I notice it weird or whatever? But it was inexplicable and, and creepy. So that was one point. And the other point towards the, the climax of the film, she's running hysterically through the house and stops at a mirror and she sees herself grinning back at herself and then she runs from that mirror to another one, and that reflection is looking more freakishly at her. Those two, again, no CG required. It was just 
a very simple basic effect, were just so chilling to me. And I would have loved for them to make the whole movie like that. I noticed something just last night, I think, when I watched it again that I'd never noticed before. And I've seen this movie many times because it is one of my guilty pleasures. But it was a shot where they're walking through a hallway past a statue of Hugh Crane. And you can see at the very end of the shot, Hugh Crane's head slowly turns to follow them for like four frames or something like that. And I don't know if it was meant to, to continue to be a more obvious thing and they just cut it there. But that subtleness, it was like, oh, did that statue just move? It was like mm -hmm. really creepy. If they would have just kept everything that subtle, it would have been so much more effective as a film. But no, they, they didn't do that at all. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Those kind of those moments of the house and and this version, the lingering spirits kind of slowly coming alive or just watching or planning and praying, I think were were powerful. But yeah, of course, not quite enough subtlety to make that really last. Less is more. You you spoke of the characters, particularly of Liam Neeson's. Was he supposed to have a, a, an accent? He's Irish. Did you notice that he was disguising it? Or I, it just sounded like Liam Neeson to me, and I wasn't sure if he was trying mm. to um, do an American accent or not. I think it was. I think he was supposed to be American, but yeah, it kind of just sounded like him. <laughs> I, I figured that he was probably from Ireland and he's Americanized now, and so he still has a little bit of lingering. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I tried to make it work in my head, but uh, for some reason. His character is the most different between each movie and the book. In the book, he was named Dr. Montague and was portrayed as an old, plump scientist type. In the 63 film, his name was changed to Dr. Markway for some reason, and he is painted as more of a romantic interest to Eleanor. That created tension and additional motivation to play against her loneliness and fantasy world in that film. But in this 1999 film... His name was changed to Dr. Marrow, all three versions of his name starting with an M. Uh, at any rate, in the book, Eleanor's potential romantic interest was for Luke, actually, instead. In this film, she holds a fascination with no one, although I understand there was a cut scene of her and Theodora fooling around, which would have been nice, but... Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think there was, um, especially with some of the, the themes, there is... A number of things that are potentially really interesting and might have done better in a, in a different film. There was a lot of sort of half baked interesting ideas. Um, they one of the things they did change is the you know it being an insomnia study of why or at least what um, the participants were told of why they were there rather than them all uh, being susceptible and having an experience with the preternatural, which is not a bad initial coax to get them there. I guess it adds a little bit of realism of why all these people, again, Eleanor was in a more desperate situation, but seemingly the others weren't. So it does offer a decent reason that they would come here, but um, really doesn't explore that. Um, the true reason they are here is uh, essentially so the doctor can – sort of examine how fear is manifested and how if you people are just given that initial tipping point or clue that the imagination will kind of run wild and create these fear responses. Um, so I feel like that was sort of presented. But then, of course, when, you know, as things escalate and they, you know, soon believe, OK, there is actually this evil entity or spirit here that's all thrown away, which makes sense to a degree. But that could have been something really interesting and in just focusing on how fear is ignited and how we respond to it. And one of his intents was to uh find better ways for the, the body to have responses that actually help us work through fear rather than let it overcome us, which again, something's not really, um, really gone into. I would say as well as uh, Crane getting a little bit more of his story adds something to it. And, um, you know, with him it kind of starts off as this, you know, especially with, um, Eleanor's sort of flight of fancy and wanting to believe both in this house and, you know, any any fictional outside world that she can kind of accept um, is something freeing and powerful to her. So she 
at first adapts the so a sort of fairy tale idea of oh, it was so romantic he built this whole palace and these were you know th- these must be his children that he hoped to have that he built it for and uh, peeling back those layers a little bit to reveal a more cruel and controlling man in the end took away that allure and futility of att- attempting to stand against Hill House which does add something but in creating him as this vicious master role in these entrapping child workers, even in death, it offers this cruel and haunting sort of interesting discussion, which almost like the the ultimate fear of anyone who's trapped in something in life, it actually kind of taps into something that was sort of the, uh, the basis of a lot of Haitian zombie lore. Uh, it was A lot of it came from uh, the people who were enslaved to their their um, biggest, deepest fear was not being able to move on to their afterlife of being trapped in, in life as this sort of uh, eventual tortured slave, essentially. And there's sort of moments of that, that these, these you know, children were taken advantage of and sort of tormented and used for Crane's benefit in life and are still trapped there um, in death. But it's kind of something that's like said and presented and then, I don't know, it's just like the, the save the day, I'll save them. But it there was just a lot of things like that that could have been really dark, interesting discussions on on human nature and what r- the most sort of horrifying scenarios could be even uh, beyond death that are kind of presented and thrown away. And maybe this wasn't the right avenue for them. So I kind of understand why they didn't go into them more. But it is kind of frustrating that there's a lot of really interesting, like the beginning of interesting potential that it kind of throws at you and then just lets pitter out. I can see how having this direction of having them there to scare them and then study that aligns with the whole theme of horror and a haunted house and You can make that work as unethical as that study is or would be. But I wonder if that's necessary. The original story in in the book of them just being psychic investigators, maybe that was just too done at that point where they felt they they needed to take a new direction. But um, I felt like having Hugh Crane portrayed as somebody who wanted to have his house filled with the sound of children didn't make sense. He didn't seem like the the kitty type or mm-hmm. the jolly Santa Claus type or anything. He seemed like a miserable old rich guy. And I couldn't quite connect why children had anything to do with anything. You could imply things from that, but the kids are are dead at some point. Did they did he kill them? Do they just die from overwork? Mm-hmm. There's so many questions there that were more confusing than anything. And I was wondering, why don't the ghosts of the kids just leave? What's keeping them there? Eleanor says that he's still hunting them, and the children seem very afraid of his ghost, but just leave. Like what's there's there's no explanation or reason for them to stick around. So that that's one of many mm-hmm. plot holes that I have questions yeah. about. Yeah, something they could explain. I mean, typically, usually when ghosts, especially in hauntings, it's usually because unfinished business or they died in a, you know, tormented or tragic way. And so they're usually stuck there until they can reconcile or, you know, be ready to move on. So I think I can mostly accept that, but it is something that they could have gone into more because it's also if they were all just people who just died in this house, what gives him more power than than them? You know, there's a lot of things that they could have gone into more is is the house. It seems like in this version, they're not going with the house as this evil entity that just captures all. It seems like they're going with Crane is is the villain. But then what made him so powerful even in death that he can still have this hold on them. In this film, it is true Hugh Crane is made out to be the primary force of evil, but when the house attacks them in like, let's say the collapsing bedroom in the hallway or the front gate or, I mean, is is that, is it all Hugh Crane? Or it seems like there there's still uh, an essence of the original idea where it's just the house that's evil too. 
And then we have all the the kids that are there, and then at least one of the wives killed themselves mm-hmm. before. So it's a bit scattered for me as to what the source of the evil is. It's like they had different drafts, and each one had a different direction. But the most confusing thing to me is the question of how are all these phenomena being manifested? You have ghost hunter shows where season after season, they might see a picture fall off the wall or a door close or something. And that's that's about it. But in this film, there's so much happening that's just off the charts in terms of what you can see, what the ghosts are able to manipulate and throwing people across the room, smashing things against walls, crushing the rooms inward and so forth. There's nothing to explain how Hugh Crane, if he is the heart of the the evil, how he could do this. He was not like a spiritual guy. He wasn't cursed. He hadn't developed some sort of power. He was just this rich guy who was kind of a jerk who killed kids or something. So what gives him this ability to manipulate reality and the ghost side of things to the degree that he does? And beyond that, Ghosts aside, how is it that a solid statue of stone or wood able to bend or twist or move, whether possessed by ghosts or not? Practically speaking, that sort of material just isn't capable of flexing, right? Yet his ghost has this mastery of manipulating ghostly and physical matter beyond anything ever witnessed in reality or perhaps even in film. And okay, so here's here's another weird point. You have this odd concept where let's say there are two stone lions above the fireplace. And when they come alive, they roar as if they're inhabited by the spirits of actual lions. Or if there's a griffin, which is a mixture of a giant eagle and uh, what's the other thing? It's not a goat. It's a... Lion? Lion, yes. That comes to life and it starts screeching and flapping its wings and acting like it's an animal. So why is it that just because something is sculpted like that shape, when it comes to life, it actually is that animal alive spiritually or or haunted by it? There's no logic there. There are these huge double doors with carvings of the gates of hell or purgatory or something with these half-skeleton men guarding it, who then come to life and actually restrain Hugh Crane's ghost at the end, as if these carvings actually became the gate guardians of hell for some reason. They're doors. They're just carved (laughs) doors. And remember, Hugh Crane built the house. Mm -hmm. Why would he put things in it that would somehow counter any of his goals or intentions or be able to stop him now or, or later? And beyond that, why does he populate the house with these ominous statues of himself and and paintings. Well, there's even one when she first walks into the um, mansion, she runs into one where there's a statue of of Hugh Crane wearing this cloak, these these black robes, gripping a screaming child trying to get away. Like, who makes a sculpture of that yeah. <laughs> and puts it in their mansion? Yeah, I think some like some of the like would this really happen? Some of it I could excuse of at the, this house is almost like in a a place of fantastical illusions and has this this spirit and almost, you know, halfway between reality and this unreality. But I think it works better if it's just like the house is this evil powerful force in itself and since that was less the focus here, like we're we're more thought to think this is Crane and or these are the people that died here in these spirits if it's just the spirits of, of what died in this house, then even if they had quick, a quick, like one minute, you know, sort of, you know, as she's looking in and finding out all about the house and what happened there before, it wouldn't be that hard for her to stumble upon something of, you know, he, uh, I don't know, had a uh, demonic, you know, um, he was into the occult or, you know, something that would give him this power. Like it wouldn't be that hard to take a minute to explain some of his power or, that it was just the power of the house. And if it's the power of the house, you almost like don't have to explain that, but it just like heavily hints that to, you know, that that could make a lot of this make more sense. Yeah, some throwaway line somewhere would have gone a long way. The book Nerd with a Nell, which I speculated when we talked about uh, the original 
novel uh, comes out more here. You see her fascination with other worlds, especially those heavy on fantasy and how she is at the point where she is at a more complete escape from this world, which is both tantalizing for fiction aficionados and lovers of the macabre, which really isn't touched on. There's a stark human loneliness and desperation at the core horror of Hill House that is suggested but not really explored here. Mental illness as a whole really isn't represented as much as it is in both the 63 version and the original novel. While Nell is seeing things others can't, there isn't the representation of an already teetering mind on the brink of loneliness, with Nell herself questioning what she is seeing and hearing before the house even gets its claws in her. The house signals her out and begins taunting and showing her things that isolate her, which is creepy but doesn't have the same questioning what is real psychological mystery to it. While the other characters worry for and are disbelieving of Nell, the group doesn't churn on her in the same way as in the other versions which also takes away from some of the human relationship complexities and loses its core theme of wanting to belong and doesn't make it so. That humanity will often let you down, reaching for a hand in the dark and only finding an evil and trapping presence there to take it. Let me comment on the CGI. Yeah. This was 1999, and it's still pretty early on in the whole CGI game of things, but those children ghosts were just the most dated-looking effects I was marveling at how bad you've got this beautiful set, beautifully lit, everything, the music is gorgeous, and then this the cheesiest looking little girl slips under the blankets or something. Mm-hmm. And there's this one shot in particular where Eleanor is in bed and she opens her eyes and there's a ghost under the sheets laying next to her looking at her. And that face, it's odd because in order for the level of detail to show up, Down to the eyelids, the upper and lower eyelids, the mouth, everything was showing up through, like the the, the ghost is under the blankets forming it. Like, how do you do, you have to vacuum form the sheets against the face to get it pressed up against the eyeballs enough to see that level of detail. It looked weird. There's a case where you could have just literally put a kid under the blanket and nobody would have known the difference because it's a kid under the blanket. It would have looked the same thing. The The CG was just so over the top. And I think because Star Wars came out that year, they had all the, the best animation people working on that or something. That's yeah. that's my theory. But All the good people were taken. <laughs> yeah, I agree. The, the CGI was pretty horrible. Again, I, I like a little bit more subtlety and anything that can be done practically is always great. I don't mind some CGI when it's well done and prefer a mixture. But yeah, it was, they definitely went for the cheesy and over the top in many ways. And the the CGI ghosts were definitely a part of that, which kind of escalated. And it kind of felt like it just got worse. <laughs> like the, by the last act, you're like, okay, this is just silly now. They were just getting desperate. Oh, we'll just, just do more. Let's we'll make it bigger and bigger. But it was having the opposite effect. Now, there are a couple of characters we see in the beginning, his assistant Mary and Todd, who is another original test subject. They were just the most useless two characters. They show up briefly in the beginning. Um, Mary leaves when a, a clavichord, which is a small piano-like instrument, snaps a string and almost takes out her eye. Something ridiculous to me happens here when Eleanor takes this small stemmed liquor glass of some kind. I don't know what it was, a shot glass of some kind, and instructs Mary to hold it against her eye to keep the blood out of it. Like she knows exactly what to do in situations like this. You take a glass and you press it against your eye and the ridiculousness of them holding this glass against her eye and every shot or some other actor having to press it against her eye when Liam has literally a a white handkerchief in his other hand, wouldn't it just make more sense to press that against the wound to create pressure and keep it out of her eye than to hold this stupid glass for the rest of the entire scene? That was just like, I don't know what the fuck they were thinking there, but it gives me great mirth in in seeing that while also shaking my head at the same time. To that point, there's a plot hole. I think it's towards the climactic part of the film where they're all desperate to escape, but the Dudleys locked the gate, dang it, so they can't get out. And they try to crash the gate and, and other desperate measures. But isn't it weird that, was it the night before when Mary hurt her eyes and had to go to the hospital, they just let her out through the gate then? Was the gate open at night then? I mean, there was no, didn't he have a key or something? It was just like, okay, well, I guess I guess whatever they did the night before, they can't do now to escape. And it, it's little stupid things like that. Mm-hmm. that I figure they should have ironed out those sorts of kinks 
in the uh, in the writing stage, but uh, maybe there was too much of a rush to get it out. Yeah, there are a lot of things like there are a lot of inconsistencies, and and you see it with Eleanor's character too. Like when they want her to be timid, she is. When they want her to be strong and confident, she is. All of a sudden, without a real evolution or showing where that growth comes from, and say, that's even more of a sort of nonsensical little detail because yeah they why they can easily leave when they want to but not when they don't which again coming back to just giving the house this power of being this powerful dark entity if it's the house if the house is like okay i don't really care about this one let her go but i want these people i'm praying on them i'm not gonna let them go i think there's something way more chilling about the house locking you in and deciding if it will let you go or not. That's a point that's confusing to me as well. We, what is the goal of Hugh Crane? Because uh, Eleanor says he means to keep her now at the end and says, no, it's too late. He won't let you go. She already indicates that she wants to, um, how they say, unalive herself so that she can go and protect the children as a ghost. So her intention is to stay basically forever in defense of the children. So you would think that Hugh Crane's goal should be to have her not die and just leave as soon as possible because she is a threat if she stays. Yet he locks her in. There's a point where he traps her on the bed, pins her down with various parts of the the bed frame and bed posts and so forth. Like, why did you even do that? Why, if you're going to kill her, just... Just stab her with one of those little pokey things. <laughs> I don't understand the the point of that scene at all, or what they're what what he's trying to do with the people. I, without a clear goal of opposition, it's just confusion. Like, what's going mm-hmm. on? What what is everybody trying to do? I assume he just kind of just wants her as his next eternal undead bride, or or what have you. But yeah, to your point, I, I guess there is something to maybe you know maybe he's getting a kick out of. Um, this this cruelty and slowly pushing her more and more on edge, but um, yeah, if he if he wanted whatever he wants to do, he probably could have done it a well, lot sooner. <laughs> yeah, and, and and I don't think that the writers knew what yeah. the fuck was going on. It was probably just a frenzy to get the damn thing out. At the end, those half skeleton characters in the door do restrain Crane. However, the fuck. They did that or whatever it means. But in doing so, they, they or I should say Hugh Crane on his way to being slammed behind the door pushes Eleanor against it. And then the, the skeleton people gently um, set her down on the ground. And it's a very crucifix-esque looking imagery, um, symbolism, which I thought was a little on the nose. But she sits up, apparently completely unharmed, perfectly healthy, without a scratch <laughs> on her. Or even upset, really, while watching all the little ghost children finally set free. So great, job done, mission yeah. accomplished. Yet, she then lies back, satisfied, closes her eyes, and dies for some reason. We see her smiling ghost float out of her body and join the swirling children's ghosts. Everything was already fixed at that point, and she didn't need to die to protect them as a ghost. But she just croaks at the end for no apparent reason with a big, dumb smile on her face. Really confusing. But her dying was inevitable in some way because she dies in all of the other iterations. They shouldn't have killed Luke. I don't know why they killed Luke. That's what I'm (laughs) upset about. Yeah, it was probably a way of with them totally changing the ending and last act and entire focus, really. It was probably a a way of them trying to be like, oh, well, we'll just connect it to how the original ending was because she dies at the end and she's part of the house, which, again, could have it could have been something if she was going to be dejected from the house and she felt like this is the only place she belonged and this was her purpose, then, okay, then, yes, I just want to die here. I think they could have just altered it slightly and it would have worked a little bit more of why she would want to die there so she could stay there. That's what you're talking about before, that if they would have established her character as being more damaged or helpless in life or or in need of the house itself as being a solution to her life's problems, then her dying would have made more sense. But uh, at one point, all she says is, I, I won't let you harm a child. And I don't know why she thought throwing a, a jewelry box at the glass window, which had Hugh Crane's picture on it, would somehow harm Hugh Crane. But 
I want to do a commentary track where I'm literally nitpicking every single shot like that one going through and explaining like, why would she do that? Come on, this makes no sense. And there are so many, I mean, literally hundreds of points that are mm -hmm. ridiculous. So yeah. uh, stay tuned for that. I don't know when Sounds I'll do it. Sounds <laughs> entertaining. Definitely coming your way. This is really a genre where less is more, where a, a pitch black room is much more frightening than one overly ornate and lit, where we just see a, a suggestion that something has changed or hear sounds. The more they did hear, the less effective it was. And the fact that they went so over the top with everything only made it worse. It was not scary. And I, I can't comprehend how anyone could think it would be outside of someone below the age of 10. And I can see how like a, a producer will say, we need to do more, I don't know, scary stuff. Like, okay, like what? Just, just make it scary. And they don't have any sense. There's a, there's a weird uh, cooperation that goes on between actual artists and people who just, they're more business people. They're, they're numbers people. And trying to make one understand the other, they both have a job and they're both important, but oh my God, how frustrating it is as an artist to try to explain story structure or character development or something like that to somebody who just wants to make sure that their script has the same kind of scene that was in this other horror film that everybody liked. And it's just so arbitrary and just frustrating as hell. But you got to learn to navigate those sorts of things as a filmmaker. Yeah, it's definitely very hard and frustrating. Um, but yeah, that is, I think, I guess it depends whether you, how much you care or not, or if you're like, okay, I'll just do what they want and take the paycheck. But um, if, if you want to put out work that you can be somewhat proud of that your name is on it. It is difficult, but it is sort of that that challenge to give the producers or people green lighting this and making this film possible, give them what they want, but also do it with so it makes sense and it still whether you have to build story reasons around that, that is part of the challenge and your responsibility and it seems that, yeah, they let a lot of that kind of just go, well, okay, they want this, we'll throw this in there, sure, okay, that, no, we don't really need to explain, it's fine. And if there would have been a little bit more focus on the why, like we said, in certain cases, it's just one or two lines could have sufficed a lot, but it, it definitely lacked in that. So a lot fa falls flat and just seems very misplaced and generic and kind of just doesn't work. I am fascinated by the fact that immense resources went into this, yet they didn't have the sense to come up with a good story to set it to. I feel a sense of what a missed opportunity this was. And if I could have had the resources they had to construct that much stuff or to cast whoever they wanted or to have Jerry Goldsmith score my film, my God, what a dream. There's such an abundance of writing talent out there clamoring for an opportunity, yet for some inexplicable reason, the writing aspect of filmmaking largely goes unacknowledged or unutilized over visual effects or star power. You would think it would be understood by now that you need a fucking script that's rock solid and bulletproof before you start to film, or at least have the ability to generate that while filming. I don't get it. It's it's common sense. Yeah, no, if you, it's true. If you don't have a good story or everything else can come together, if it's just style over substance, or you have the beginning of a compelling story, but you don't explain things, then everything falls apart. No one's, no one's going to like that movie. If you would like to join our society of grotesquery and loathing, please subscribe and give this podcast a like. Comment your wretched thoughts below, along with what you would like us to expose in future episodes. Keep our podcast suffering on by finding it in your cold, black withered hearts to support us on Patreon. A link to our PayPal is also below for one-time donations of any amount. It, it was, was nice, nice knowing, knowing you. you.